Hello everyone, my name is Gemma and I'm from IDP IELTS in Australia. Welcome to our first masterclass in our three-part series. We are live across all of our global Facebook accounts, so thank you for joining wherever you are in the world today. In today's masterclass, we'll be taking a deep dive into how to best prepare for the test and boost your potential IELTS score. Our presenter tonight is the one and only Don Oliver. Some of you may already know Don and attended his masterclasses online or in person. Don has 30 years experience working with IELTS and he's gonna share his top tips for preparing for IELTS today. If you're joining us via Zoom, feel free to leave your question in the Q&A box. And if you're following along with us on Facebook Live, please share your questions in the comment section and we'll try and get Don to answer as many as he can today. So please take it away, Don. Thank you, Gemma. Okay, so as Gemma said, this is the IELTS Masterclass brought to you by IDP. And uh, again, wherever you are in the world, welcome. Today, we're talking about preparation. Now, when we talk about preparation for IELTS, it's a very important thing to learn the format of the test. And we're going to explain the format. That means, what does the test look like? How many parts are there to the test? It's another important thing that you need to, to understand, and that is how are you assessed in speaking and in writing? We'll look at the assessment criteria for both of those as well. And finally, we'll point out some of the IELTS preparation tools that are available to a test taker. Now, IELTS is a big test, and it's been around for a long time it's a very well-respected test. And the reason it's well-respected is that many, many institutions, many universities, professional bodies, governments recognize it. And that's about 10,000 education institutes and organizations worldwide. If you wanna study in an English speaking country like Australia or Canada or United States or Britain, then all of those institutions will recognize IELTS as an indication of your level of English. But it's not just in countries that speak English. In other nations like Germany or South Africa or France, in Japan even, people will recognize the IELTS test as an indication of your true level of English. Okay, in order to prepare yourself, for the IELTS test, you need to do a few things first. And that, those things are basically these. First of all, you need to understand that there are two types of IELTS test. There is an academic test and a general training test. The IELTS academic test is used for university entrance. It's used for professional registration for some professions. The general training test is very often used for immigration purposes or to show an employer your level of English. It's important for you to find out from that university or that professional organization or that employer what band score they require. There's no pass or fail in IELTS. A score is given to you which indicates your level. And that might be exactly the score that you need. For some people, it might be a band five. For others, it might be a band six, seven, or even eight. As I said before, you need to understand the design of the test, the format of the test. And it's important that you look at some IELTS preparation materials and practice using those in order to understand the sorts of questions that you are asked and how much time you have to answer them. That means preparing for the test. But one of the things that I wanna point out to you very strongly today is it's not just a matter of doing practice tests in order to prepare for the test. One of the best ways to prepare for the test is to improve your English. The IELTS test, as I said, is a big test. And that means anything that you learn in English 
It might be from a song, a book. It might be something that you hear from a friend. That will help you improve your score in IELTS. The final thing, of course, is you should book a test date. And we'll show you where to do that at the end of this presentation. So here is the format of the test. This is what the academic test looks like and the general training test. Now, in Australia, where I am, writing is the first part of the paper-based test. In most other countries where you are, it will be listening. The academic test has writing, reading, listening and speaking, and so does the general training test. The academic and general training are exactly the same for the listening and the speaking. For both of them, you will have 40 questions for listening and 14 minutes to do your speaking test. The writing, however, and the reading is a little bit different in the academic and the general training test. We'll talk it about those things, those differences at length in a moment. Okay, where you are, you may be able to do the test via a computer. You may be able to do the computer-based test, the computer-delivered test. And it's very much the same as the paper-delivered test in terms of the content. In fact, it is exactly the same the types of questions, how long you get to answer the question, the types of tasks are all the same in the computer test or the paper-based test. But the computer-delivered IELTS test has a few advantages over the paper-delivered test because you will get your results more quickly. Within five to seven days, you will get your results from a computer-delivered test as opposed to 13 days for the paper-based test. There are some other advantages in the computer test as well. You can do the test on your choice of five days or even more a week when you do the computer test. You can choose a different time of day to do your test when you do the computer delivered test. With the paper delivered test, you will only be able to do the the test on a Thursday and most likely on a Saturday. The length of the test, the contents of the test are the same for both the computer and the paper-based test. Okay, IELTS gives you a score. Now, if you're listening to me today and understanding what I'm saying, you are probably not any of these band scores. That is one, somebody who does not speak English, two, someone who speaks only a little bit of English, three, someone who speaks a little bit more English, four, someone whose English is quite weak, but who can make themselves understood. You are more likely to be a band five, a six, a seven, an eight, maybe even a nine. And here you can see a description of how well you perform at those levels. Very often, a university will want a minimum band six. So let's look at that. This means you generally have an effective command of the language. You make a lot of mistakes, but people understand you most of the time. A band seven, of course, is someone who makes far fewer mistakes and is able to use language which is more complex. You can see these uh, band descriptors in the uh, material on our website, IELTS Essentials, and refer to them and see where you fit. Of course, these nine scales are in effect double that because you can get a 5.5, a 6.5, a 7.5. Okay, let's start by looking at the reading part of the test. Now, as I said, the reading is a little bit different for academic compared to the general training. But for both the academic and the general training, you will be asked to read about 
two and a half thousand words, that is three fairly long passages of about 800 or 900 words and answer 40 questions. The problem, of course, is you only have one hour to do it in, and this makes it a difficult task. Later, in a minute, I'm going to give you some advice about how you can speed up your reading and answer the questions more effectively and efficiently. The general training is also a matter of answering 40 questions in one hour, but the types of questions and the types of reading are a little bit different. The reading here is a little simpler, often based on work situations, a list of rules, for example, or instruction, more to do with everyday life, for example, looking at a list of advertisements. And the third part of the uh, reading in general training is a longer passage, which is quite similar to the longer passages in the academic reading. So as I said, we test your reading skills by asking you to read a lot of words in a short time. Very cruel, I know. But there are some tips that I can give you to help you speed up. And the first one is skimming. Now, skimming is something that you do already in your own language. When you look at a newspaper in French or in Japanese or in Arabic, you don't read every word, do you? Your eye goes across the script very quickly to find something that interests you. That is skimming. You quickly look at the article that you, have, you find interesting to see if there's anything new there that you want to learn about. That is skimming. Now, it's a skill you have in your own language, but it's a skill that you can practice in a foreign language, in English. So practice that. Say, I'm going to read this page in two minutes. You won't read every word, but you will be able to get a general idea of the meaning. And the next thing you do is scan. And this scanning is looking for a particular piece of information. Think about when you look at your newspaper in your own language, you want to find the football score. You find the name of your team. You find the number of goals that they kick. This is scanning. Again, you can practice doing this in English. And many of the questions in the reading paper will ask you to find a word a number in the in the question and you can find the answer by scanning scanning and skimming are skills that you can acquire by leaving the dictionary alone and by giving yourself a time limit of course sometimes you need to read in detail as well you need to know is it in or is it on is it with or is it by is it most or is it all this is reading in detail. But for many of the questions in the reading test, you don't have to do that. In effect, it means you don't have to read 2,500 words. It may be that you only need to read about 1,500 words carefully. And that means you will be able to answer those questions more quickly and be able to answer them more accurately. Okay, the reading. I keep saying that IELTS is a big test. And one of the reasons it is so well respected throughout the world is that it is a very good indication of a person's true standard of English. And one of the ways that it establishes this true presentation of your real level of English is by using a variety of question types. Now, some tests will only use one question type, and that is multiple choice. That's one of the test questions in the reading. But we also have other ones where you have to decide, is this statement true or is it false or is there no information about that statement? 
Sometimes we will ask you to match some information with a paragraph or some information with the person who said this thing. Sometimes we will ask you to complete a sentence or complete notes in a diagram. And sometimes we will ask a question like, when did this happen? Who did this? A short answer question. All of these types of questions establish confidently your true level of reading ability in English. And that is why you can use your IELTS score in virtually any situation throughout the world. Before we leave these question types, let me point out one important thing. Do you see there is a little asterisk next to some of those question types, a little star? For example, multiple choice, asterisk. This means that the questions in this type of question uh, task come in the same order as the answers. Now this can help you. It's an important point to remember. If you answer, if you, if it's a multiple choice question task, if you answer question 21, you know that the answer to question 22 will come sometime after the answer to question 21. And the answer to question 23 will come after that. This helps you navigate your way through the reading passage and hopefully it will help you answer more quickly and more effectively. Okay, that's reading. Let's look at the writing now. And as I said before, the writing is different for academic and for general training. The academic writing is a matter of writing 400 words, 150 for the task one and 250 for the task two. That means the task two is more important. It's twice the mark of task one. Task one in the academic writing is always about describing some visual information. And we're going to look at an example in a minute. It may be a graph, it may be a table of figures, it may be a diagram, it may be a map. You are asked to simply describe what you see. Task two is an essay where you are giving your opinion. Now giving your opinion is not always natural for some people who have graduated from a particular school system. But in the IELTS test, we really demand it because if you are studying at an English speaking university, then this is one of the most important things that you are asked to do, to have an opinion and to be able to express your opinion. I wanna add here that anything that you do to improve your opinion essays in writing will also help you in your speaking test because it is exactly the same skill. Having an opinion and being able to express it is judged in your speaking and also in the writing. It's the international English language test and that means you can use American spelling, you can use British spelling, but spell it correctly according to one or other of those systems. Here's an example of a task one in academic writing. Now, as I said, task one is looking at some visual information and simply describing it. Here, the visual information is the process of manufacturing bricks. But I often tell students this, they are surrounded by processes in their everyday life. Do you like to cook, for example? If you like to cook, next time you cook, then think about the process. Think about what do I do first? What is the order of the steps in producing this food? It might be that you uh, have a hobby and uh, you uh, make uh, model planes or maybe you collect stamps or something like that. Well, what is the process involved in this hobby? 
every time you look at around yourself, you will see a process and you'll be able to start describing it to yourself. This is good practice for academic task one. The task two, as I said, is always giving your opinion. And you are always given the task two in the same form. And the form is this, you are given a statement. And here in this example, the statement is quite simple. University graduates earn more, so they should pay for their study. Then you are asked to respond to that statement. And here, the response that is required is also quite simple. Do you agree? You can answer this question quite easily by saying, I completely agree, or I disagree, or I partly agree. Sometimes, however, the statement is a little bit more complex. It might be, some people believe that universities should be free. Others believe that universities sh should charge fees. And then the response might be, discuss both of these views and give your own opinion. Now, this is a more complex task. So be very careful. In task two, read the task carefully and give an answer that actually addresses that task. Remember, it's 250 words that you should write here, but don't write too many more. Don't write 350. Again, time is essential. Try and spend about 40 minutes on this task and leave yourself a little bit of time to check your work. Okay, that's the academic writing. The general training writing, as I said before, is a little different. The task one is a letter. You write 150 words as you would in the academic, but you are writing a letter to a person and explaining something to them. In task two, in general training, the task is very similar to an academic task too. You are asked to respond to a statement and give your opinion. Let's look at a general training task one now. This is a good example of a general training task one. You'll see that you are always given the situation. In this case, you have heard about plans to build new apartments in a park. You want to give your opinion about it. Then you are always told who you are writing to. And in this case, it's the editor of your local newspaper. And you are always given three or maybe four points that you should cover. This is very important. Covering these three points is essential. If you forget one of those points, you will be penalized quite severely. And also remember, you're told at the very beginning how to express yourself. Should it be formal or should it be informal? In other words, is the person you are writing to unknown to you or is it a friend? Dear sir or madam means that you are writing a formal letter. You don't say, dear sir or madam, how are you? I'm very well. No, no, no. That is informal. So be careful about the tone of your letter. In general training task two, as I said, the task is very similar to an academic task two. And here, this example is quite a complex question. In many countries, people are eating more and more unhealthy food and taking less exercise, two things. What are the causes of this problem and what, are, and what are the solutions? In other words, you have to deal with four things. What are the causes of people eating unhealthy food? What is the solution? What are the causes of people doing less exercise? What is the solution? Four things you need to do for this task. If you only do two things or three things, then that will be penalized. Be very careful to read the task carefully and answer. Fully. 
Okay, that's the writing. Now let's look at the speaking. Now speaking is the same for both academic and general training. The speaking always has three parts to it. And those three parts are quite predictable. The first part is being asked a set of questions about the most interesting thing in the world, you. Now, if you ask questions about yourself, then you are preparing yourself for the first part of the speaking test. Ask yourself, why do I like that? What is my favorite food? What do I like to do on the weekend? Ask your friends these questions. This is good preparation for the first part of the speaking test. The second part of the speaking test is always where you are asked to speak for two minutes on a simple subject about someone you know, about a place you know, about an event that you know of. It could be about an object that you possess. Again, you can practice this. You can prepare for this. Make it a habit to spend two minutes every day speaking about something that you know about. I could speak about my cup of tea for two minutes easily. How would I do it? I would ask myself some question. Why do I drink tea? How do I make the tea? Where did I buy the tea? How often do I drink tea? For example, ask yourself many questions about these things. And another thing you can practice is making notes. Because at the beginning of part two in the IELTS speaking test, you are given one minute to make some notes to help you speak. Now, making notes is a skill, and it's a skill that you should practice. A good set of notes will be maybe 10 words, not sentences. 10 words that you can talk about. And if you do that, make it a habit, learn the skill, then you will be able to speak with some fluency, with some ease in part two. And we're going to look at the assessment criteria in a moment. And it's important to be able to speak fluently. Finally, in the speaking test, this is what I said the writing will help you do. You're giving an opinion. You are discussing an issue. You are talking about what may happen in the future. You are talking about what is good and what is not so good. The topics that you find in part three of the speaking test are all about what people, educated people, like to talk about. The environment, the, the climate, the uh, development of cities, uh, employment and unemployment, education, the health system. These are topics that recur, not only in the speaking, but also in the task to writing. So talk about those topics with your friend and read about them. Okay. I said we were going to talk about how you're scored in the speaking, and this is how you're scored. There are four criteria. And the examiner is asked to make a judgment on four separate aspects of your speaking. The examiner doesn't say, oh, that is a six. The examiner says, oh, it's a six for this criterion, but a five for that criterion, and a seven for the next criterion. That means if you get a, a score of six, it may be that some of your performance is in fact better than a six, and some of your performance may be weaker than a band six. What you need to do is look Go to our website, go to the IELTS Essentials website and look at the assessment criteria in detail. That might give you an idea of where you are strong and where you need to improve. Very briefly, these criteria are fluency and coherence. Do you speak fluently? Now, I think I speak fluently. 
because I'm an old man. And I've said this many times before. I don't speak too quickly. I don't speak too slowly. I'm able also to connect my ideas using words like as well, of course, but on the other hand, besides. These little words are words that the examiner is listening for. If you're able to use these words naturally and effectively, then you will get a good score for fluency and coherence. The second criterion that the examiner looks at is your lexical resource. And this is the same for your writing. Do you have a variety of words? Do you have words that, that produce an exact meaning? Can you use the precise word for the precise meaning? Can you use words that are very natural? In other words, idiomatic. Can you use words that a native speaker might use to describe a particular thing? The third criterion the examiner looks at is grammatical range and accuracy. Is your grammar accurate? But accurate grammar by itself is not enough. You need to be able to show the examiner that you can also use longer sentences, not just short, accurate sentences but sentences that are more complex. If, for example, you can use the word if, this introduces a complex sentence. If you use that, then you will get a good score. If you're able to use a relative clause, a relative pronoun, I'm a person who likes to do this. I come from a place where there are lots of etc. The examiner will say, yes, these are complex sentences used accurately. So practice that. And finally, the examiner will give you a score for your pronunciation. Now, pronunciation problems exist for everybody, depending on what your first language is. Accent is a different thing. My accent is an Australian accent. I like it. There's no problem with that. You will speak with a Japanese accent or a French accent or an Arabic accent. That's okay. No problem. The problem comes though if people cannot understand you. And that is where you need to practice very carefully imitating the sounds of English. And you're very lucky. Because in this day and age, you can go onto the internet and look at YouTube, you can look at videos, you can listen to people doing podcasts, and you can practice for hours until you get that exact pronunciation correct. We're going to finish up with the listening, and the listening, as I said, is the same for both academic and general training, and it's always four sections and always 40 questions. Like the reading, there are different types of questions and there are different contexts, different situations that you're asked to listen to. In, in the first part of the test, you are listening to two people have a conversation about an everyday event. In the second part, you are listening to one person giving some information about an everyday situation. In the third part, you are listening to two or three or four people in an academic situation talking about something to do with study. And finally, you will hear one person giving an academic lecture. That is probably the hardest part of the listening test, but you should practice listening to all of those types of uh, conversations all of those types of listening in order to prepare for your listening test. So we've talked about how you look at the test and what the format of the test might be and some suggestions for improving your English. You can improve your skills uh, with the computer delivered test by going to uh, 
IELTS essentials and going to the familiarization part of uh, that website and looking at a practice computer test. It's not a full test, but will give you a very good idea of how to use the computer in the computer delivered test. You can go from there to a masterclass, and masterclasses are usually conducted at test centres. You can find out when there is a masterclass near you, and occasionally we will do them uh, via webinar like this one. Look at the website and see when the next one is coming up because they are very valuable. They go for 90 minutes and you can ask questions at the end and find out exactly what you need to know to improve your score. As well as that, we have an offer where you can access a brilliant IELTS preparation uh, course, which comes from Macquarie University in Australia. I've looked at this myself and it's very good. It's, it's very complete. And you are given access to one of the modules of this test, this practice uh, preparation uh, material, for free when you uh, book your test. You can also get a discount on the full um, uh, preparation course as well. Another thing that we provide to candidates is the IELTS progress check, and this gives you an in Indicative score, that means it's not an official score, but it shows you approximately where you can expect to uh, get a score. And this is a very useful tool for somebody who is deciding will I do the test now or will I wait until I improve? It covers all parts of the test you will receive your indicative score within five days and it is marked by real IELTS markers, official IELTS markers. You will receive a report which will indicate where you need to improve. There are also free practice tests on our website. Uh, they are the same uh, for the paper-based test as for the computer-based test. The material is the same. Uh, the types of tasks that you are being asked to complete are a very good indication of what is on the real test. As well as that, we have the IELTS Advantage, which is also available online. You can watch that on YouTube, and it gives you some very good advice about uh, how you should prepare and what to expect on the test day. There is a preparation guide which you can uh, get. Um, you, it's a booklet which really tells you step by step what the best way to prepare is. It will tell you about question types and it will very importantly give you some tips which will improve your test day performance. If you are a new test taker, if you have not done the test before, then this will be particularly useful for you, I think. The free practice online uh, preparation course from Macquarie University and the preparation guide. Another thing which is dear to my heart because I helped develop it a long time ago is the IELTS writing assist and the reading assist and the speaking assist. And these give you very, very detailed feedback on your actual performance. It's a personalized uh, detail analysis of where you went right and where you went wrong in your writing, reading and speaking. So I would advise you to have a look at that as well. It's very useful, especially if you are a repeat test taker and find that you just can't get that extra band that you need. All of these things are useful, but as particularly I want to remind native speakers of English that they should do some preparation too. Because I've talked to many native speakers who are disappointed with their results. They think, okay, I'm a native speaker of English, I should get a nine, but they don't. And that's because they fail to properly prepare. 
They don't understand the format of the test. They don't understand some of the assessment criteria. So please, even if you are a native speaker of English, do have a look at these things too. It may save you some pain. Okay, your next steps are these. Visit the IELTS Essentials website because all of those materials are there for you to find. You'll be watching us perhaps on Facebook as I speak. So look on, on Facebook because there, are, there is a lot of advice there and you can put your question there. We're gonna answer questions in a moment, but if we don't get around to answering your question, please use Facebook, put them there, and somebody will get around to answering those questions. There are free practice tests, as I said, the official IELTS support and preparation product. All of those things are available to you, including support videos on our YouTube channel. Okay, so this is basically it from me. And now I'm going to hand back to Gemma, who might decide to give me some questions. I shall. Thank you so much for that, Don. That was very insightful. And we're running perfectly on time too. So we've had quite a few questions come through on our Facebook channel. Um, and if you still have a question for us, there is still time to, to leave one that we can answer for you either in the Q&A box on Zoom or via your Facebook page. Um, but John, we'll get started. The first question is, will I handwrite or use a PC in my IELTS test? Uh, that's a good question. It really depends on which type of test you're going to do. If, of course, if you do the computer delivered test, all of your writing will be done with the keyboard. And uh, this, of course, has an advantage for those of us who are good at using a keyboard. Of course, we sometimes make little errors, typographical errors using a keyboard, which we would never make if we were using a pen. So my advice is to be careful to check your spelling when you use the keyboard. If you're doing the paper delivered test, the paper-based test, of course, you will use a pencil to write your essays and to write your answers in the reading and the listening. And here, it's very important <clears throat> to check that your handwriting is clear. So clear handwriting is an important thing, not just for the written, uh, the writing task, but also for the speaking, uh, for the reading, and also the listening as well. That's perfect, actually. That goes into our next question. Someone's asked if they can write their test all in capital letters. Um, that's a good question. And the answer is yes, you can. <clears throat> There's no problem with doing that. Uh, if you want to write your essay using capital letters because your handwriting is not clear, that's okay. If you want to put your answers in the listening and reading in capital letters, that's okay. But can I recommend that you don't mix them all up together when you're writing your essay, because then it may become unclear where a sentence begins and where another sentence ends, and that will be a punctuation error. So if you're going to use capitals, use all capitals and be, try and use them um, systematically. Great, and speaking of mixing things up, Someone's asked, will they be penalised if they mix UK and US spelling in their writing? Um, this is not a problem. I think it's unlikely to happen, though, because we normally, if we have, uh, for example, I always spell colour, O-U-R, and I'm very unlikely to start spelling it O-R. Um, but as I said earlier, both uh, British and American spellings are acceptable, and if you were to occasionally use one spelling and another spelling in the same piece of work, it's not a problem. Great. Now, we've got a really great question here about the speaking test and how it's marked. How do the examiners mark the three different parts of the speaking test using the four criteria? And how do they consider the three parts together? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the examiner will give you a score on your average performance. It may be that you are not very good at uh, speaking for two minutes 
in part two. The examiner will understand that this is a difficult task. And if you are quite fluent in part one and in part three, then the examiner is likely to be quite generous about a lapse in part two. But uh, it's wise to recognize the part that you need to practice so that your performance can be uh, quite consistent through the three parts of the test. And, and finally, the last thing that the examiner hears is part three. So naturally this will have, and, and it's also the most complex, it's also probably the most demanding part of the test. And because it's the last thing the examiner hears before they give you a score, and because it gives you the chance to show more complexity, uh, a bigger range of vocabulary, for example, um, then I would say that part three is probably the one where you would want to be performing at your very best. So practice that. Okay, great. We've got quite a few questions coming in about the speaking test. So Don, you touched on using native words um, earlier when you were chatting about the speaking test. What's the best way for someone to learn native words? So native speakers will use some very simple words, but with particular meanings. And a good example of that is the word get. Now, there's no simpler word in English, but a native speaker will understand the difference between get on, get around, get into, um, get fit or something like that. Uh, this is, this is a simple word, but as soon as you're able to use these simple words in a natural way and appropriately, then the examiner will say, well, this shows that this person has a sophisticated, that means a deeper understanding of the language. So when you hear those words, then make a note of them and make a note of the context, where you heard those words, how they're used, and make sure that you use them yourself. The more you use a word, the more it will become part of your uh, performance in a, any test. So there are books, of course, that say, you know, a thousand English idioms, but I would recommend that you, that you go to websites, go, go to YouTube, watch videos, listen to songs, and make a note of some of those very natural types of combinations of words and start using them, make them your own. Great. And just staying on the speaking test also for a moment, a test takers asked, um, who will mark my speaking and my writing test? Is it the same examiner I meet in the speaking test? Uh, in the speaking test, the examiner who marks you is the person who examines you. And that mark will be given as soon as you leave the room. The examiner will look at the assessment criteria and decide on your score for the four different criteria. In the case of writing, however, there will be a minimum of two examiners who don't know each other and who don't know your identity at all who will give you a score. One will give you a score for your task one and another person will give you a score for your task two. Neither examiner will know the score that was given by the other examiner and the combination of those two scores will be your final score. And, and I just might add, Gemma, that it's a minimum of two examiners, but it may be even four examiners, because if your score is very different to your reading and listening score, then another two examiners will check that and give independently two more scores. Great, thanks, Don. Still on speaking, a lot of questions about speaking today. Uh, mm. I have a question about speaking part two. Do I have to use the full two minutes? For example, if I exceed the limit or if I don't use the two minutes, what will happen? Um, you won't exceed two minutes because the examiner will stop you gently, say thank you very much. Uh, it may be that you can only speak for a minute or a minute and a half. If that's the case, then the examiner will say, can you tell me anything more about that? So be prepared for that question. The examiner will point out maybe one of the, the points in the task that you didn't cover. You know, can you tell me more about 
how you felt about that, for example. If that happens, then try and speak for a little bit more. If the examiner, however, says, thank you very much, that's good because you have reached the two minutes and that means that the examiner has to move on to part three. So that's a good sign. Every time the examiner interrupts you, you should be very pleased because it means you are giving a lot of language and they have to move on. So don't, don't worry about that. Right, and another one about speaking. So if the topic giving them the speaking test is something I'm not familiar with, can I ask for another topic? Will I be penalised for it? Also, can I ask the examiner to repeat a question if I don't understand it the first time? Okay, so there are two questions there. To answer the last question first, can you ask the examiner to repeat something? Yes, please do. Ask the examiner that question. Ask the examiner any other question you like. You know, do you mean this? Or can you explain that word? You should do that because that means the examiner is able then to explain a word or to repeat it. Uh, of course, if you do that too often, of course, the examiner will say, oh, well, maybe this person's vocabulary is not very strong. But you can do it a couple of times. That's no problem. But the first question was, can you ask for a change of the part two task? And the answer is no. You can ask, but the examiner will, will say, I'm sorry, you have to uh, talk about that. And, and just to remind you, what, as I said earlier, the task is never difficult. It's a, it's a simple task. It's about something, someone you know, a place you know, a thing you know. Even, Gemma, if, for example, you were asked, can you talk about a book that you enjoyed and you never read books, you can speak for two minutes about why you never read books and what you prefer to read or a movie that you saw that was based on a book or why your friends like to read books, etc. So there's no problem. You don't really have to directly um, talk about the task as long as you talk around the subject. Great, let's move on to listening. So someone has asked, in the listening part, can I get a second chance to hear it again if I didn't hear it the first time? Unfortunately, no. The listening <clears throat> comes and then it goes and never to return. And so you need to be concentrating from the very first second to the very last second. Don't allow your mind to wander into what am I going to have for dinner tonight or something like that. Don't do that. Practice concentrating for 30 minutes without, without uh, losing your concentration because you cannot hear the recording twice. Great. And here's a very topical question uh, from someone in the Middle East. Should we expect topics related to coronavirus in the writing and speaking modules? Uh, no, not specifically coronavirus. But you may be asked about public health or um, problems with uh, 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 the, the development of uh, uh, new diseases or something like that. If that's the case, then please talk about coronavirus. Bring it up yourself. But the types of topics that are used in IELTS will never be ones that are emotionally charged. And some people have suffered terribly from coronavirus, maybe losing um, relatives or friends. So we would never ask about that. But if you wanted to use the coronavirus as an example, then please do that. You know, you say, oh yes, well, public education is important, especially when it comes to things like coronavirus. That's a perfect answer, but it won't be in the question. Great, thank you. Okay, um, someone has asked, does an examiner know which country we are from and mark according to our accent? Um, the examiner in speaking will know which country you come from because they look at your passport and uh, they may even ask you, where are you from? And they will probably talk about uh, your hometown. 
and where you live. Um, that's okay. Uh, but it won't affect your score at all. Um, the examiners are all very experienced teachers. Very often they have worked uh, overseas in many different countries. They will very often speak more than one language and they understand that people have accent. Um, it's, as I said earlier, accent is not a problem. But as soon as your rhythm, your English is not, does not have the natural features of English, as soon as you cannot pronounce particular sounds so that it becomes unclear, then that will affect your um, pronunciation score. Great. Okay. And I can um, I add just with one oh, thing? Of Jim? course you may. <laughs> with, that's with the speaking, but with the writing and the reading and the listening, your identity is completely anonymous. No one knows who you are or where you're from. Okay. Great. Okay. Someone's asked what's the maximum words we should write in the writing task one and task two essay. Yep. Um, maximum words. It's difficult to give you an exact figure because some people write quickly. Some people write without any mistakes at all. A native speaker might feel that they can write 250 words for task one. But I would recommend as a general rule, that you should not really exceed about 180 words for task one and should not really exceed about 280 words for task two. It's important that you leave yourself a little bit of time at the end of each task to quickly check your work because this really could improve your score quite dramatically. And um, uh, little spelling mistakes, little grammatical mistakes, uh, writing that's unclear, you can fix them up in two minutes. Great. Um, someone has asked, can you clarify, is the speaking part recorded? And is it useful to record yourself while, pre while preparing for speaking? Um, the speaking test ask for ARIMA. And remember that IELTS um, test takers can always ask to be remarked. It costs a little bit of money, but um, it, it's, a, it, it's a, an option that is always there. Um, the recording is also used to monitor examiners to see if they're doing a good job or not. Um, and uh, it might be a good idea to record yourself and to share that recording with other people to say to your friend, well, this is me speaking. Do you understand everything that I'm saying? Because sometimes we ourselves are not conscious of our mispronunciation. We might think that we are pronouncing things exactly perfectly, but in fact, it might take us another person to be able to set us straight. Great, and moving on to a reading question. I don't think we've had one yet. Um, someone's asked, what's your best strategy to uh, tackle the reading passages? Um, well, there are several strategies, I think. Uh, it might depend on the type of question you're being asked. I mentioned a couple of strategies earlier on, and they were skimming and scanning. When you skim, it would be wise to look at the heading of the passage. It would be wise to look at any diagram that accompanies uh, the passage. It would be wise to also look to see if there is a glossary of terms at the end for any difficult words that are, uh, that are in the reading. Then it would be a matter of, skimming to get a quick idea of what the general um, design of the uh, piece is um, and the general meaning of the piece and then to look at the question. Now if you start with the questions that can direct you to the right spot in the text. So for example if the question is um, uh, who discovered uh, penicillin, right? Penicillin. As soon as you find the word discover or the word penicillin in the text, you know that you will be fairly close to the answer to that question. And that's because you looked at the question first. So that's a good strategy, I think. And, and as a general rule, the more words you know, 
the easier it is to read. So make learning words systematic and make sure you do it every day. Great, thanks Don. Well, we're at time. So I think that's enough questions for you in the hot seat tonight. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. The seat is very hot. It was very hot. I know there were some great questions that came through. So thank you to everyone that submitted one. Um, if we didn't get around to answering your question today, we will respond to you uh, via um, the Facebook comments that you have left. So thank you for that. So that's a wrap for tonight. Uh, Don will be joining us uh, this time next week, 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time for another masterclass with a focus just on writing. So we've had a few more questions come through about writing, save them for next week, and uh, Don will do a deep dive into that. So thank you everyone who attended. Thank you, Don, for your time, and we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you.